Hello, everybody. It's one o'clock and welcome to the webinar that the MMSA is hosting today on critical minerals, penalty elements from mine to metal in the Copper Valley supply chain, Zoom webinar, May 14th, 2021, at 1 p.m. Mountain Time. Um, I'm Susan Wager. I'm the executive director of the MMSA and we are hosting a series of webinars and critical minerals has been something that many people are interested in. So I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker today. Our speaker is Michael Motes. He's a professional professor of metallurgical engineering at the Missouri University of Science and Technology. He's also the director of the Thomas O'Keefe Institute for the Sustainable Supply of Strategic Minerals. So uh, it's uh, a pleasure to be given this opportunity to talk about uh, a topic that I'm really passionate about, which is the copper supply chain. And then, you know, it seems like right now everybody's uh, really interested in these, these things called critical minerals or critical materials. And at least in the copper supply chain, many of those, those elements are actually what we call penalty elements in the uh, in the supply chain. And so uh, really it's this is a, a talk that came out of a, a recent paper that myself and some colleagues wrote. Uh, Professor Wu uh, Ofe is online uh, with us today and, and Professor Alagua is uh, also uh, one of the co-authors. And so when we talk about critical mineral production in, in, in the copper, um, you know, before I kind of get there, I want to do a little bit of, you know, who I am and where am I from. Of course, I'm a professor at Missouri University of Science and Technology. Uh, if you're kind of old, then you know us as University of Missouri Rolla, and if you're kind of really old, you know us as Missouri School of Mines. We're a heavy engineering school uh, located near the, the old lead belt, new lead belt of Missouri. Uh, we were formed in 1870. We uh, produce about, uh, we're a top 20 producer in uh, the total number of engineers. Uh, in the United States. Uh, we represent, we have disciplines across the entire metal supply chain. So we go everything from geology through mining, metallurgy, manufacturing, environmental policy, uh, business, environmental, all of that. And we're kind of a medium sized uh, research university. Uh, it's my pleasure that I get to direct uh, an initiative that was started about three years ago here at, at Rolla, uh, which was the, the Thomas J. O'Keefe Institute for the Sustainable Supply of Strategic Minerals. Uh, we kind of picked strategic over critical because I think in some ways the word critical gets lost in its meaning. And in fact, sometimes people will just think all critical minerals are the rare earths and that's not true. Uh, and so we're hoping to, as I say, as the director, what I'd really like to do is get things off of the critical mineral list. And that means that it's no longer a supply risk uh, to our country's uh, defense or, or economy. Uh, just me personally, I'm an aqueous electrometallurgist uh, who works heavily with industry. Uh, almost all my funding going back to the 16 years of being a professor have come from industry. I, I work a lot with uh, the copper, gold, zinc producers of the world. Uh, here recently, uh, we've been invited to join the Critical Materials Institute out of Ames. And uh, we're working on some critical mineral projects looking at uh, cobalt production here from Missouri and then capturing gallium, germanium, and indium from uh, secondary zinc, zinc sources uh, with a zinc plant in North Carolina. And of course those, I often joke that I, I really just do bucket chemistry. Uh, we make buckets and you know, we try to basically simulate very large scale production in the lab in a way that the results are meaningful and, and useful to the industrial clients. A lot of the focus right now on critical minerals is this, this energy transition that we're going through and I tell my students that uh, anytime you hear the word decarbonization, you should smile because as metallurgists, that means we need more metals. And uh, as an extractive metallurgist, that means we're gonna have jobs for a long time. Uh, the, 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 the plot here on the left is, is a recent uh, plot generated by the um, IEA. They issued a report uh, just this past week. And uh, what you can see there is as we move from natural gas and coal uh, to either solar or offshore or onshore wind, the amount of metals that we're going to need are going to increase by a factor of two to six to 10, depending on which, which, which denominator and numerator that you want to use. 
and the light blue there is is uh, is copper. And so uh, so you can see that we're going to need a lot of copper. And if we do a lot of uh, wind, we're going to need a lot of zinc for the galvanizing of the steel structure. And so no matter what you look at out here, you're going to need more copper. And and so really the the need for copper is regardless of what the energy source is, if we're going to go to electrification and move away from fossil fuels, uh, we need more copper. And the IEA in their report says that the concerns are not related about the resource. It's it's there's plenty of quantity. It's the quality that we have to worry about. Which, as as mining people or metallurgists, we know for a long time now, the issue has been that we have a long-term trend where the ore grades are declining, and the deposits are becoming more complex. Which means they they have more impurities and they're harder to separate. And so that's really the the, the thing that we face. And it's really these impurities. Uh, at least in the copper supply chain, is where some of these critical minerals, critical elements live. And, and can we capture those and turn them from impurities into, into something of value? So if you're not familiar with the copper supply chain, I'll just give you a, a real high level view. Uh, depending on what type of mineral that you have, you either go through a hydrometallurgical process, which is leaching, solvent extraction, and electroinning. That's about 55% of the US production. Um, or if you have sulfides, uh, especially chalcopyrite and, and boronite primary sulfides, then you're going to go through the traditional flotation, smelting, electrorefining to produce um, refined copper. Uh, secondary sulfides in the middle, uh, basically there's some, uh, you can either do either way, it depends on the economics of the project. And so about 45% of the U.S. production is through the uh, flotation, smelting, and electrofining. What's important is we talk about impurities. Uh, we don't really capture byproducts from the hydromet process, at least not here in the United States. And, uh, and so any byproducts, any critical minerals are gonna come from the flotation, smelting, and electrofining route. So that's what we're gonna focus on today in our discussion of the copper supply chain. I'm not gonna really talk about the leaching, solvent extraction, and electrofining, because at least at this point, it's not economical and the quantities of elements uh, are pretty minimal uh, in the PLS in the pregnant leach solution. If you don't know about the world copper supply, um, basically about 80% uh, of the primary copper comes from uh, flotation, smelting, and electrofining. 20% comes from leaching SXEW. Um, and if you then look at secondary, then of the total refined copper, about 17% comes from from recycling. And uh, this talk is really gonna focus on the, the primary uh, production. Uh, if you wanna ask some questions about secondary, I can try my best to answer those, but we're gonna focus on primary production. And so you can see that concentrate growth is growing. And so it's really whoever controls the concentrate and the smelting of the copper uh, is gonna control the, the production of these minor elements or critical elements. So I've now used the word critical minerals or critical elements multiple times. What do I mean? Well, every country or the EU is, uh, we'll say as a country, as a large group, has their own critical list because uh, depending on what their natural resources are, what their, uh, what their smelters, uh, metal production facilities are, they're gonna have different things from, that they're critical about. And criticality usually means that um, there is a high likelihood of, or a high risk of supply disruption and if that disruption occurs, it's going to have a significant impact on the economy and the defense. That's at least the way the United States um, defines criticality. And so the, the green little squares are what's in the USGS, US Geological Survey Critical Mineral List that they published in 2017. Um, I believe they're going to come out with another one soon. But um, anyway, if we look at those green elements, a lot of times when people hear critical minerals, um, they think rare earths because uh, that's what really has been in the news for the last decade. But if you look at it, it's a lot more than that. And so the ones we're going to focus on, the ones that might come out of the copper supply chain, are really uh, arsenic, animal bismuth, and, and tellurium. Um, you can get rhenium. We'll talk a little bit about, about it in India, maybe. Uh, but really, we don't do that on a, on a regular basis. And over there on the side, you can see what these some of these critical minerals uh, are related to energy. But again, remember, some are about defense um, and some are about other types of uh, economic concerns about electronics. So when we look at arsenic, antimony, bismuth, tellurium, 
a little lump of selenium in there just because it tends to follow along with tellurium. These critical elements in the, in the copper supply chain are often called penalty elements because if there's too much in your concentrate coming from your mine, the, the, the smelter will penalize and buy the concentrate for less money from the miner. And why are they penalty elements is because they, they can uh, foul, the process, foul the smelting and refining process and produce off-spec copper at the refinery. And so over here on the left, you can see the ASTM standard and you can see that there's really just parts per million that are allowed in the copper. And the reason that it is, is we take the copper that we produce and most is eventually turned into copper wiring. And so as we start with you know, a billet and draw it down to a rod and then draw it down to, to wire that you, you know, put in for somebody's house or, or windings around a motor, um, in that drawing, these impurities will cause wire breaks and cause production issues. Uh, it also can affect the electrical conductivity, but mostly it has to do with wire breaks. And so here's a picture of, you know, some copper rod being produced at a continuous caster. Uh, I think that one's in Mexico, but, um, and so these penalty elements, uh, miners tend to avoid them and suppress them in their concentrate because of course the smelter penalizes them and the miners don't make as much money. So we actively suppress these critical minerals from entering the copper smelter or the copper refinery because we don't make any money off of it. And so now we've said they're critical. And so really we, we as a group here at Missouri s and we said, well, let's go back all the way to ore look to see what we know or don't know about these penalty elements and uh, critical minerals. And, and let's figure out, is there ways that we might be able to increase their production if we knew more? And so that's really what we're gonna, the crux of today's presentation is, is the outcome of, of that. And of course, that's what I just said, is that we're gonna, we're gonna try to figure out how to turn the silk, you know, sow's ears into a silk purse. Or we're gonna try to create value out of impurity. Like the tellurium is, is a penalty, is, is an, an impurity that causes problems in copper production. But ca cadmium telluride is, is a um, high efficiency solar uh, collector and is used in thin film solar panels that are produced by First Solar. Uh, and as you can see, here's a flow sheet of how, you know, two impurities, cadmium and, and tellurium, cadmium from the zinc circuit, come together to make something that's really good for solar energy. And so is there something similar to that from a business standpoint, an animony standpoint, and an arsenic? Now, I know I say the word arsenic and the general population says rat poison, right? This is highly toxic and deadly. And, and of course, they're right. The problem is that gallium arsenide is the semiconductor that we use for all of our wireless uh, radio transmissions. And so whoever controls the gallium arsenide production controls the ability to make chips that are going to go for Bluetooth and wireless transmission on a, on a small scale. And so arsenic is even important when it comes to electronics. So going back to the flotation, smelting, refining flow sheet, um, when you look through the literature, just kind of an overview, right? We're going to go through comminution and flotation. We're going to take a, a, an ore, we're going to crush it, we're going to grind it, and then we're going to use surface chemistry and we're going to it. So here we have a flotation cell. We're going to lose a bunch of critical minerals in the tailings at this point. And the question is, how much do we lose and, and what mineral form is it? Could we potentially try to get more of it? We do also create a byproduct uh, if the copper ore, and there's a lot of copper ores in, in Arizona uh, and, and Utah that uh, have molybdenum, uh, molybdenite as a, as a secondary mineral. And so we float and molybdenum concentrate. And so those molybdenum concentrates can have rhenium. I'm not gonna talk about that today because I only have so much time. But the concentrate, the, the copper, copper sulfide concentrate that comes out of flotation goes into smelting and converting and fire refining. So this is all in the smelter. And basically there's all sorts of dust, slags, gases that come off and they contain some of these impurities. Now some will get recycled back in and we'll talk a lot more about that. Eventually we make 99% pure copper, which we call an anode. And then we electro refine it, which is a a process where we actively dissolve the copper into a um, sulfuric acid electrolyte solution. And in the process of doing that, we dissolve it in, plate out high purity copper, 99.995% copper. Uh, and in the process, those impurities go somewhere. And so they either go into what we call the slimes or into the electrolyte or solution. 
And that's where they accumulate. And that's where we can right now actively go after them. So we're gonna go through each of these steps and figure out what we know and what we don't know about arsenic, animal, and bismuth, selenium, chlorine. So when you look at the copper deposits, and this is a very busy slide, I apologize for that. I haven't figured out how to, how to make it a little bit easier. The takeaway from this is that in general, we don't know a lot because the arsenic, antimony, and bismuth, unless they're really high concentrations, uh, they tend to be in the tens to 15 ppm, same with selenium and tellurium. Uh, maybe the arsenic is a little bit higher. And if it is higher, uh, if it gets up to the, you know, 1000 ppm, 1500 ppm, 5000 ppm, uh, we tend to, to, we try to avoid those because of the um, environmental ramifications and the penalty elements aspect of it. Um, and so, and so a lot of the times the deposits, we, if they're high enough, we avoid those areas, um, unless there's a lot of gold and silver, uh, and then we deal with it. Um, but, uh, but usually the, the selenium and tellurium are, are, comp are basically substituted into the sulfide matrix, the ones that we capture. Uh, arsenic and ammonia can create complex copper sulfide. So this is the enargite and the tetrahedrite. Um, and, and bismuth can form complex sulfides or even be separate, separate sulfides by themselves. When you look through the literature, there's not a lot of information. Now, I'm assuming companies have more information, but, but uh, what's published in the literature is pretty scarce. And because of you know, small sampling size for large deposits, assaying of, of PPMs, the question is we don't really know. And selenium and tellurium, we know tellurium will form tellurides with, with um, gold and platinum group metals. And so you know, our, our hypothesis or question was, you know, could we tie some of these things to valuable materials? I know of one deposit where the gold tends to be where the bismuth is highest as well. Uh, so when they get higher gold in their concentrates, they get higher bismuth coming to their smelter as well. So, so things like that, could we tie these things together to entice uh, mining companies to bring in these penalty elements into their circuits uh, because they bring in more value? And uh, of course, we all know that mining companies are really good at bringing in high value materials like gold and platinum anyway. So maybe it's, maybe it's a little pie in the sky academic uh, view of this, but um, in general, we, we found the open literature information on, on what in the deposits related to the critical minerals to be, to be pretty, uh, pretty minimal. When we look at the mineral process and we go through combination and flotation, flotation of course is where they make, we make the separation. When we look at the concentrates, there was a wonderful report back in the 1980s, early 1980s, where the U.S. Bureau of Mines went through and characterized the tellurium content, selenium content, and, and a host of concentrates produced in the United States. Of course, most of those mines are now shut down. So when we went through and looked at more recent data, again, the amount of concentrate data is, is minimal. You're always wondering about grab samples. Um, how accurate is this really from our day in and day out? Um, We've done some work with, uh, with the copper company to help understand the portment of some of these elements through their flotation, smelting, and refining. So I know some of the data exists, at least internally with companies, uh, but from the outside looking in, uh, it's sometimes hard to get at. So again, when we do have data, it tends to be not associated with mineralogy. They tend to be just grade. So we don't know where the arsenic, antimony, selenium, tellurium, bismuth, and so forth are all, are all tied up. And there's really a, a kind of a poor fundamental understanding of why we depress it sometimes and why sometimes it floats. When the concentrate gets to the smelting, it's all over the map. Uh, there are, in copper smelting, there's at least six or seven different types of furnaces that do the smelting. And as such, uh, the deportment of, of elements coming out of those, out of those primary smelters uh, can be can be dramatic. So we have here the Autotech flash furnace, uh, the Isosmelt, which is a top blown lance, and then the newer Chinese bottom blowing SKS furnace. And you can see that while there's some overlap of where the arsenic, antimony, bismuth uh, report, um, there's some differences. And, and those differences relate to the mat grade that's produced at the end, uh, which is the copper concentration at the end, um, or how it's run. And so there's quite variability here. The dust, so anything that comes off in the gas tends to report to a dust phase. And that dust, as you're going to see in the next slide, um, get, typically gets returned back to the smelter. 
um, because there's high values of, of copper there. So a lot of the things that end up in the gas go around and around and around and around until they either go out in the anode or the slag. Um, again, these data are difficult. They're typically grab samples. So it's questionable how, uh, how much variation there really is uh, over time. And the other thing is when we talk about dust in this next slide, uh, I had a project where I tried to get some dust samples from some copper smelters and I was told, uh, no, you can't have those um, because if you're buying your concentrate on the open market and I know what type of furnace you have and I know what's in your dust, then I can pretty much estimate what the penalty elements were in your concentrate and I can figure out what you're buying your concentrate at, which means I know what your profit margins are. So custom smelters who buy concentrate on the open market and bring it in, the dust is kind of like a fingerprint for what was in the concentrate and it's critical proprietary business information. So getting that dust samples, you'd have to have a, uh, a quite a good relationship with a, with a smelter. With that said, there have been dust samples uh, published in the literature. Uh, we estimate from our calculations, there's about 1.2 million tons of dust produced per annum uh, from different copper smelters around the world. Most of this dust is recycled and you can see why. Over here, we calculate kind of a typical dust grade based on kind of the middle of this flue dust. Um, and you can see some prices that we used in our calculations, the amount of tonnage that would be in this 1.2 million. And of course, you can see that there's about a billion dollars worth of copper in the dust. So we're gonna go after the dust for the copper because all the other elements are dwarfed. Now, the selenium looks really interesting. Uh, but that's really, there's only one published value on the thorium content that's in dust. So I have no idea what's really in dust, but based on the one data point, this is what it would be. You can see there's quite a bit of bismuth, uh, quite a bit of arsenic, and, and of course, animal, those are, are fumed off. That's one of the things that we try to do during smelting. Um, and since the dusks are dust are recycled, um, it's not clear what the really sustainable production rate would be if we took all the, say magically, we took all the dust out and treated it to recover the arsenic, animony, and business selenium, tellurium. Um, I'm not really sure if those concentrations are real or they would drop because you're not recycling and have a recirculating load anymore. But we took the information that we had and tried to guesstimate what this would be. And so you can see there's some value in this, maybe in the tellurium based on one number. And, and probably the bismuth, and that would be what you would target if you wanted to treat your flu dust. Now, treating your flu dust has the benefit of you remove these, these elements from your refinery, which is where the problems are right now because they would tend to end up in the refinery and cause problems. Um, and so if you could remove the dust, capture the copper where the value is, and then also capture your, your critical elements, there could be some value to the, you know, there may be a value proposition to the copper uh, smelter, uh, refinery, but um, I know of some people who thought about that. There are some companies who do that. There are some companies who take dust off and treat them, but typically the animony, bismuth, and so forth are not captured. They're just disposed of. Finally, we're at the anode. So we've now gone through the smelting process. We've gone from a concentrate, which has maybe 25 to 30 weight percent copper in it. We've gone through smelting, which gets us up to a mat of 50 to 70% copper. And then finally, a, a, a crude copper of about 98, 99%. And we get to anodes that are around 99%. So there's a line of, of anodes. I think I took this down in Mexico at, at the Narcazari refinery. And we put those anodes into a bath of uh, copper sulfate, sulfuric acid, and we electro refine them. So this cell, looks, I think that's in Peru. And so, Worldwide, I'm part of a group that um, surveys as many refineries who, that will respond to us. We're in the process of doing this again for the Copper 2022 meeting that's gonna come up next year. But this data is from 2019. So the world average that we know based on tonnage, so it's a weighted average based on the capacity production of each facility that we, that we uh, analyzed or surveyed. You can see that we went from tens of PPM of these values, maybe hundreds of PPM in the deposit, there's not a lot of concentration really going on in the, in, the, in the flotation circuit. But as you go through this primary smelter, or smelter, when you get to the refinery, we, we've seen a significant uptick in the, in the um, concentration of these elements. So maybe a factor of, of you know, 10 to 50, depending on the element. 
Uh, so there's a lot more concentration in, in the anodes. In the anode phase, um, most of these elements are in little secondary. So these are the micrographs. And so you have a copper grain and a few of the elements are dissolved in the copper, but most are in these inclusions around the grain boundaries. And what happens to those inclusions when we go through the process to find whether or not they're gonna end up in slimes, which are solid particles that are left over after dissolving the copper, or they're gonna dissolve and go into the electrolyte. And so you can see for the group 15 elements, the arsenic, antimony, and bismuth, that there's a whole range of what happens. And in fact, you go back way from early in my slides, one of the projects we have funded by several of the copper refineries is to understand better about these group 15 elements because they're, they're problematic. Um, wh why are they problematic? Because they can produce what are called floating slimes. And floating slimes are particles that are colloidal. They float across the, between the anode and the cathode and they get encapsulated in the cathode and make off that copper, lead to short circuits, cause low, low current efficiency. And so the, the control of arsenic, antimony, and bismuth in the anode and the electrolyte is really critical for an electro refinery. It's been like this since time eternal when we invented the process in the 1850s. So the anode dissolves. Some of the elements go into the electrolyte. Some stay solid and collect on the anode. So you can see the pretty copper anode has turned black. That's this powdery material. Some has sloughed off, fallen off, and entered the concrete cell at the bottom. So if you look under a micrograph, it's just a hodgepodge of particles. Those particles have been well characterized over the years. We know all the phases that are there. And you can see here from the same survey that we, that we did in 2019, that for every ton of anode that we produce, we get about five and a half kilograms of slimes. And those slimes, again, have a lot of copper, but you'll see that we have a lot of silver and a lot of gold. And we have a 9%, nine weight percent silver and almost one weight percent gold. So obviously the value in, in slimes is in gold and silver, um, but there's a lot of selenium, tellurium, arsenic, animal and bismuth. Now we're talking weight percents. So again, we've had another factor, uh, concentration factor of another 10 or 15. And so now these slimes are ripe for processing, uh, not only to recover the silver and the gold, but potentially for these other critical elements as well. There are a lot of different options to treat your slimes. Now, I'm not gonna go through them all. There's about, there's about, I think seven commercial ones and probably three times of that, you know, that have been developed and tested at some scale. Uh, let's just say that if we really want to get arsenic animal and business selenium to learn, we can, uh, and some companies do. And tellurium probably is the one that's gotten the most. And even so, based on our calculations, well, I'll show you here that in the next slide. So if you look at the anode composition and how much copper anodes are produced in the world, and you just multiply it by the weighted average like we had before, if we were to capture 100%, which I know is, in fe is not feasible, but at least it's a starting place, this is the amount of potential tonnage of each of these critical elements that you would produce, or you could capture just by recovering all the elements that are in the anodes. So what I'm saying is don't change anything about mining, don't change anything about flotation, don't change anything about smelters. This is just what's available in the anode. And this is the worldwide production according to USGS. And so you can see that the amount of selenium in, a co in copper anodes is probably is two to three times more than the world's production. Tellurium is four to five times. Not so much in ars arsenic. You could basically create all of your arsenic out of, out of um, copper production worldwide. Uh, antimony, not so much. Bismuth, not so much, but, but a significant quantity, at least 30% of it. So there's significant values here in the anode for the, related to these um, selenium, tellurium, and so forth. So, so why don't we get them, right? I mean, they're critical, therefore they're important. So why don't we get them? And the short answer I think is, well, they're not economical. Uh, and I think some of it has to do with operational focus, which is what we call the term in, the, in, in, our, in our paper that we wrote. And so the, two ref, the three US refineries, um, you know, we just took what's in their anodes and multiplied it by their production rates to try to give you, you know, to, to get a sense of what's the value. Of course, it's a copper refinery, so we'd expect the, the, the biggest value in anodes to be copper. And you can see that it's essentially a billion dollars a year uh, at that five, 
580 a kilogram. Of course, copper price has gone up now, so it's more than that. But you know, you have a billion dollar copper refinery, and you're going to capture, we'll say, 100 million dollars worth of gold and 50 million dollars worth of silver. So of course, you're going to really focus on the copper. You're going to focus on the gold. You're going to focus on the silver. And now we're going to ask the copper companies to focus on selenium, tellurium, arsenic, and ammonia bismuth. And you can see the values there. While some of them might be in the millions, they just dwarf in scale. And so why do we even recover any of them uh, is the other question then. And, and really, it's about disposal. If I can recover them in a way that doesn't mess up my production and I can sell them for a little bit to make up for the cost of removing them, then yeah, so let's, let's remove them. So um, the three US refineries, I've, I've mixed in then with um, uh, the two uh, North American refineries, the one in Canada and one in Mexico, uh, just to try to hide their, their uh, entities. But of course, anybody who's smart enough and knows the industry knows which ones they are. There's a lot of information here. The short answer is we don't really recover much. We recover tel tellurium because uh, we have to. I won't get into great details about that, but we have to. It messes up the process if we don't recover it. And most of the recovery is as a copper telluride, which is not good enough to go into cadmium telluride production. So it has to be refined. And there's really only one tellurium production facility in North America. Uh, so most of the copper telluride either goes to that one facility or leaves North America. We don't really recover much selenium, though it is, it is recovered in a couple of the refineries. And arsenic animal and bismuth is not really recovered, though there is a refinery that has a, a specific unit to make bismuth chemicals, uh, but it's no longer running. Now, in the last slide, I should have pointed out that Rio Tinto just announced, uh, Kennecott announced that um, they're going to build a tellurium capture unit. So they're going to start recovering tellurium. So that's really refinery number five because they've just announced that. So the question is, can we do something to help more tellurium be recovered? Um, because even when we're capturing the copper telluride, we may only recover about 50%. So why aren't we capturing more of it? And is there something that we can do to enhance recovery of, of antimony and bismuth? There are, there are known solutions to remove antimony and bismuth, commercially used um, to remove it from the electrolyte. And could we enhance our com companies here in North America and the United States to do that, to recover some metals? So, We've been talking about the copper supply chain and, and the critical minerals. And so I hopefully, you know, hopefully I've given you a kind of a broad picture of where, what, what we know and what we don't know along the way. And of course, this slide is just to say, remember that whoever owns the copper supply chain owns all of the byproducts. And you can see that the byproducts that I'm talking about mostly are gonna be captured at the refinery. And so whoever's refining the most metals refines capture potentially at the tellurium market. And so this is just over the last 25 years, what's happened in the United States versus China, which I think we all, well, anybody who's interested in this space knows this to be true. So it's kind of daunting. These, these circles, the square, the surface area is drawn to scale. And so what we can see is that while cop copper mining in the US has declined, this, the, the production facilities in, in refineries, uh, not electro-winning facilities, but just refineries have dropped dramatically over the last 25 years. And so a lot of times when people are talking about critical minerals and domestic supply chains, they, they keep saying we need to find new deposits and we need to produce more mines. I'm not saying that's not true, but mines typically produce mineral concentrates. And those mineral concentrates have to go somewhere because we don't actually produce metals. We produce those at the smelter or at the refinery. And if you look at um, what's gone on with the U.S. over the last 25 years. It doesn't matter if it's copper, lead, zinc, aluminum. The amount of smelter and refinery capacity de decline is, is dramatic. Uh, and that has not been experienced in Europe or in Japan. So the question is, why us and not them? But that's a question for another day. So we need refinery capacity to capture these things, and we need, and we need critical minerals refining afterwards, because even at, at this point, we're not going to recover uh, Anemone is animal metal, or bismuth is business metal. If, if that's what we wanted, as it has to be refined further. So, kind of some thoughts that we have at the uh, O'Keefe Institute is obviously we do think that we should be exploring for more mineral exploration. We think there's some real things that can be done with 
with newer technologies, uh, looking back at old core samples to identify new deposits that are critical element rich, uh, critical mineral rich, uh, a Christian hunting industry. I know this is gonna sound like a broken record, but we need to be better at streamlining and bringing on mines. Uh, we need to develop processing and refining infrastructure and innovation. I think we, we need more smelters and refineries in the US. Um, you know, one of the things that's really been interesting, I think in the gold and silver space is this, these companies that have formed as uh, basically capital providers uh, to mining companies. And they'll do so by, by signing offtake agreements. Once the mine's up and running, we're gonna take these resources. And so, so could there be some sort of agreement between green energy? And I don't know if I really mean green energy like the Teslas or the solar panel producers or whatever, but someone who's gonna produce the raw materials from them, can they provide some capital up front? and say, if you give me the feed feedstocks for these critical elements, then I can refine them further. And I'm gonna do that by giving you the money up front to put in the animal meat recovery circuit in your refinery. Um, so is there some sort of facilitating of that? Maybe the government could help with that. You know, can the government help with that discussion? And of course, you know, I think uh, I would be amiss if as an educator to say that uh, you know, the number of mining schools and metallurgy schools keep declining. Uh, we're one of 11 ABET mining programs and one of seven or eight metallurgical engineering programs left in the U.S. And, um, and we're dwarfed in size by just, you know, in the sheer numbers. So we need innovation. We need new thoughts. We need new, uh, we need new blood. And so we need to be able to educate them the next, next round. So hopefully, uh, in summary, uh, I haven't talked too fast. I tend to do that. I get passionate and I get wound up like the Energizer Bunny. I just keep going and going and going. Uh, but, uh, you know, the idea here is that basically the primary copper production in North America has declined and so is the byproduct production. The world copper supply chain could supply pretty much all the world's needs of, of selenium, tellurium, bismuth, and arsenic. Uh, but most of those are not going to be done in the U.S. because we don't have smelters. So we need some new smelters. Um, Critical mineral capture suffer because of the relatively low value and low tonnage, and therefore incentives are needed or research is needed to improve their recovery and, and refining. With that, I'd like to invite you all to uh, a workshop. Uh, it'll be a hybrid workshop this year. We're, we're trying to do in person, and maybe we made that choice too soon with the new CEC guidelines, but this uh, August, we're gonna do some online uh, meetings, and then next year, we're gonna have an in-person meeting. And so, if you'll just type in resilient supply of critical minerals, uh, we'll pop right up on your website and you can register. Uh, we have a whole bunch of people coming from all over to talk about how we can, you know, increase our resilient supply of critical minerals here in the United States. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention and, and hopefully try to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much, Professor Boats. Um, we do have time for questions. If you would like to ask some questions, you may do that either by moving your cursor to the bottom of your screen and pulling up the Q&A or via the chat. And I will repeat your question uh, to the group and then we'll get an answer. I did have one question about the slides and we are recording this session and the session recording and the slides will be posted on the MMSA website, which is www.mmsa.net. Okay, we do have uh, a question. Uh, how does critical mineral concentration vary between types of copper deposits, e.g. porphyry versus VMS? So, um, you know, it, I don't know if we looked at VMS specific in our, in our analysis. Um, the porphyry deposits tend to be lower. Um, the SCARN deposits seemed like they were higher, as I recall. I'm going to see. I'm just going to go back. So those are the ones that we that we looked at. These were maximum concentrations that are listed in this table. Uh, and I'm not sure that I know the BMS off the top of my head. 
I'd, I'd have to go back and look at the literature, so I'm sorry about that. Okay, second question, the pressure oxidation facilities in Nevada will have excess capacity beginning in five years. Can these be used economically to capture critical metals? It's a hard question. Um, you know, I'm pressure. Well, if, from a, if you're going to treat copper calcopyrite uh, or, or copper minerализаtion and going to go pressure leach, um, the some of these elements uh, would report to the electrolyte, um, would create a dirty electrolyte. Um, then it would depend if you're going to do solvent extraction to upgrade the copper and leave the other elements behind. So maybe I think is a good, that's a nice wishy-washy answer. Um, and so Stephen, I'm not, I'm not sure I know the answer to that one, but it's a, it's a clever thought. I know that the Chileans have been looking at, they have a lot of excess electro-winning capacity as, they, as they've gone deeper in their porphyry deposits and they've been looking at using pressure oxidation to take their concentrates, which are rich in arsenic and therefore they, they have to blend before shipping to China and you know, Cadelco in 2015 announced that they were going to start pressure leaching and using the electro facility. They said they were going to do that by 2020, but I haven't heard any updates on that. So conceptually, yes. Practically, I don't know if it would be economical. Okay. And then the next question, could you explain about the meaning of resilient supply in your presentation and the workshop? Yes, so the word resilient is really a term that's being used a lot in, in the government right now, especially in the defense agencies. And it's really a, a word to say that we're de-risking the supply chain. And so how much de-risking do you want depends on where you are in, in that organization. So if you're the defense department, you want everything domestic because if we get into a shooting war, we want all the production inside the boundaries of the country. If you're, if you're um, less worried about a war, then you're just worried that the supply is coming from um, areas that are less geopolitically risk uh, and also, you know, from credible supplies, non-conflict minerals, you know, minerals that are sourced responsibly, those, those type of things. So resilient is really more about being able to withstand shocks to the system and therefore de-risking the supply chain in case of disruptions caused by economics or war or whatever. Okay, um, we have a comment from Stephen Yops, CapEx investment direct refit of Pox in Nevada has been prohibitive. We have another question. Do you have any evidence of minor slash critical containing rock being left behind purposely in a mine plan because of the undesirability in concentrate? Eric, I have, I have anecdotal evidence that there are places where the arsenic is really high and people have avoided the arsenic. I don't think they typically avoid the selenium and tellurium because they're usually associated with gold and silver. Um, you know, there was a, the issue with tellurium seems to be that the one or two studies that were done indicate that most of the tellurium is rejected at flotation. It's not clear why. Um, and then antimony and bismuth, uh, I know that, uh, Eric, you could ask our good friends at Newmont who are on the line about their bismuth uh, concentrates, uh, bismuth in their concentrates and whether or not they avoid those um, from some of their mines, but, but I, I don't know that for sure. Okay, our next question. I understand there is a new facility in Copiopo, Chile, which will produce, process and refine refractory ores similar to the high A's ores from El Indigo Gold Deposit in Chile. There is a real cleanup of tailings and dust required. And what do you know? 
I'm sorry, Mary, I don't know about that. I know in the in the you know in history, the Chileans ran a copper roaster to roast off the arsenic and captured the arsenic in the off gas and made arsenic trioxide and sold that as rat poison uh, or something. Uh, of course, arsenic used to be used in wood treatment, right? Copper arsenic wood treatment, but that but we can't do that anymore. So I am not familiar with that uh, development. I can't comment on. I'm sorry. Okay, we have a, another question. Floroya in Peru produced this critical element for polymetal polymetallic copper, lead, and zinc concentrates. Should we not also be looking at this type of polymetallic concentrates? Uh, Francisco, I mean, yep, you bring up a very good point. I think one of the issues in the United States is that our, our, our metal producing companies have become very um, one dimensional in metals. I mean, they may produce some minor, but you know, if you go back just 20, 30 years ago, there were multiple metals like, like a Sarco used to have lead, zinc and copper smelters and could smith, could take dust and residues from one to the other to the other, which led them to have, you know, the facility there in, in uh, globe that produced a lot of these minor elements. Um, and, and, you know, that's all gone now. So, I do think there's some polymetallic deposits that would be of interest, but of course it's always metal metallurgically challenging. Um, it is interesting to say that Umicore in Belgium uh, gets residues and slimes and all sorts of you know electronic wastes, uh, and somehow has made made it economical to recover 19 elements at their at their facility there in Belgium. So why can they reduce? Why can they recover 19 elements? Um, you know, and so, yeah, if you go to the Amarillo refinery, they have this big monument to outside of the Asarco refinery where they list all these elements that Asarco used to recover. So I think it is interesting that maybe we should be looking at polymetallic, but it's gonna be, you know, it's often difficult to process those concentrates to produce all those metals at one facility. Okay, our next question. Are there any advantages to recovering critical minerals from dust rather than slime? You know, I, I tried to get to that in my, in my analysis and thought process when we were writing our paper. And, and it, I think the analysis is going to be dependent so much on a site to site basis of of what you have. Um, the, the issue is when it comes to slimes, again, it's about not making sure you don't mess up the copper production. And so could you, by doing it, to me, the only reason you would treat the dusts instead of the slimes is as a way to remove the arsenic, antimony, and bismuth before you get or, or reduce the amount of those elements getting to the, getting to the anode to make refining easier, which might allow you to go to a higher production rate. So it's it's a complex analysis, and I, I just I think it would have to be so much site dependent. Do you have enough copper to go faster? And if you remove the arsenic and ammonia bismuth, could you go faster? So to me, it would be not only tying the critical mineral production, not only tying to capturing those elements, but then getting them away from the refinery so you could be more more productive. I hope that answers your question. I, I typically it's going to be slimes, but I think you could maybe justify getting out of the dust if you could tie it to the increased copper production. Maybe that's a clearer way to say that. Okay, I think this next one is a comment. Tech at their trail smelter finds a place to put all of their material, with the exception of a few hundred kilos of material. It seems that they need to look at the economics of their end products. Currently, they were putting the majority of their aids to wood preservatives. We have another question. When you say that particular metals from slimes are disposed, where are they disposed? Would it be possible to stockpile them for future recovery? So disposable means that they are put someplace where the local regulation authority says it's okay to put. 
So this could be in a landfill. This could be in a deep well injection. This could be uh, in the heap leach next door. Um, it could be in a lot of different places. And so um, typically it's landfill uh, because they're non-toxic uh, and, and the lo local authority says they can do that. Could you stockpile them for future? Conceptually, yes. Mining companies don't wanna be stockpiling waste on the ground because then they have to deal with it later. So conceptually, yes, practically, I, you know, unless there's a really high value there, I don't see people doing that. Okay, let's look at the next one. Does electrolyte purification step fit into recovery of these critical elements? William, you're absolutely right. And I just, I, I realized I took that slide out uh, when I was preparing, trying to slim it down to make sure we had enough time for questions. Electric purification very much is that you could, um, there are places in the world that recover our uh, animony and bismuth from electrolyte purification. The Japanese use ion exchange resins and have been since the 1980s. And they then take those uh, materials come out and feed them into a lead smelter to recover the animony and bismuth pyrometallurgically. The, there's also those ion exchange resins in Spain and in Chile and in Canada. Uh, to my knowledge, they are not recovering the animony and the bismuth. Selenium and tellurium don't report to the electrolytes, so you can't get them there. Uh, arsenic typically just gets plated out during the liberator cells and gets sent back to the smelter because we need the arsenic. We need a certain amount of arsenic in the anodes to make it all work. So it, yes, animony and bismuth from electrolyte purification should be gotten. Um, there's also the MRT technology that Amarillo used to get bismuth directly out and make a bismuth sulfate salt that could be sold. That's been done in the United States, but that, that facility is not care and maintenance right now. Okay, uh, what about iridium? Is that a critical mineral? It is a critical mineral. Uh, and I believe that Colorado School of Mines has a project on looking at indium in copper smelter slags or something similar to that. Uh, I know that there's been studies looking at indium in some different slags at copper smelters. Um, I just didn't, we didn't address that because the data is really limited on that. Uh, it would probably be only in the smelter phase would be my guess, or the slag phase. Okay, um, could environmental regulation motivate higher critical mineral recovery? It could, it also could motivate shutting down facilities. Good, go either way. Okay, we're coming up to the end here, but um, I think we have time for a little bit more. Could you economically build a specialized treatment hub for the US copper industry for a single destination for dust and sludge? If so, where would you build? Are there SPACs that would fund? What would be the estimate of the permitting timeline? That's a pretty long question. First one, I've thought about it. Um, you know, as a professor, I don't really want to become a businessman. Uh, so I think the only way that it would be economical is if the copper companies gave the dust up to get rid of the arsenic, antimony, and bismuth and you get to keep the copper to make it profitable. Uh, that would be the only way to do it, I think economically. Regarding anything else, you know, estimating permitting timelines, you know, you're gonna be looking at years, anytime you bring out a new production facility, but, but that's just a guess there too. Okay. Mike, this all gets a policy and what the government is willing to do to incentivize mining companies because a mining company wants to drive value for its shareholders. So with the right incentives to produce CMs at reasonable cost, including um, reclamation liability, they should be able to do this. Thoughts? <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, so look, it's, it's, you know, do you use the, the question before, can re environmental regulation motivate this? Absolutely. That's the stick approach. 
uh, is there a carrot approach? Um, so, so the the federal the FDA the federal the Food Drug Administration uh, have, Congress passed a or Orphan Drug Act, which basically said there's these minor diseases that are not enough that are not big enough to warrant a cure because you can't justify the eventual sales. Uh, but you know it's very deadly or very harmful to certain people, and so they created this o Orphan Drug Act that if you create a cure for one of these um, sicknesses, that the government will give you a voucher to go to the front of the drug approval line and you can sell that voucher. So there are drug companies who are developing cures for these small you know, diseases, diseases that affect a smaller number of people to get the voucher to go to the front of the line because then they can sell it to a very large company uh, to get them to the front of the drug approval line. So the value is in the voucher, which costs the government almost nothing. So the question is, is there, and I, and I thought about this long and hard and I, I, I can come up with a few things, but I sh keep shooting them. And so in my mind, this would be Congress sitting down with the CEOs of companies, either startup companies or large mining companies, metal companies saying, we want you to produce more of these critical minerals. It doesn't have to be the list that I gave you today. It could be any of them. What will it take for you to do that? What can, you know, I'm from the government, I'm here to help, but seriously, what incentives can we give you to produce those in an environmentally friendly way here on domestic soil from domestic resources, or at least resources that are low risk um, and produce that here in the country? And so to me, that's the question, the policy angle that I would ask. And with that, I guess Susan knows that I'll be testifying or providing comments to Congress on Tuesday about this exact topic. Okay, well, thank you, Professor Motes, and to all our participants. And I would like to mention again that this session has been recorded, and the recording and the slides will be available on the MMSA website, which is www.mmsa.net. And thank you all for very much for participating.